the apostolic doctrine, which is the world's greatest message, and the message for this message, you don't give up that truth for nothing. Not for money, not for position, the apostolic doctrine which is the world's greatest message and the message for this message you don't give up that truth for nothing not for money not for position not for prestige not for power not for love not for, for romance you don't give up the apostolic truth for nothing that's what it means when it says by the truth instead of not so St. Paul tells the saints in Thessalonica he says prove all things hold fast that which is good anytime what we believe as apostolics cannot be tested it is not the real thing real truth can be tested but here's the thing you do throw it out if it's the real truth it'll stand up all by itself now I'm saying why some smart Christians believe dumb stuff we have to identify what a Christian is, what a Christian truly really is. Now, if I were to ask you, hey, brother or sister, what is a Christian or what does the word Christian mean? I'm not going to ask you because I'm afraid you might tell me it means Christ-like. If you tell me the word Christian means Christ-like, all that simply means is you never looked it up. You didn't look in the dictionary or the lexicon. And my mama taught Susie, my sister and I, don't use words you haven't looked up because you might be using the word wrong. I remember one time I told my friend Horace Pitts, that's Cornelius Pitts' brother, Elder Pitts' son. Growing up, Horace Pitts was my best friend. And I was telling him back in 1939, say, man, I can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm so anxious for Saturday to come to go on the Sunday school picnic. 1939, I did the 6396 band court. My mama called me in the house, had the dictionary open in the, on the kitchen table, Abbott's Ready Reference Dictionary, opened to page 39, column 1 and paragraph 8. It said anxious, the adjectival form of the noun anxiety, something that will make you nervous, uncomfortable, and put you under stress and duress. And my mama said, since you're anxious about going on the Sunday school picnic, you ain't going. I don't want you out there falling out and being all nervous. I said, oh, mama, I didn't mean it like that. She was teaching me a lesson to look up words to find out what words truly mean. So this word Christian, they say it means Christ-like. It doesn't, but let's pretend that it does. Let's pretend the word Christian means Christ-like. Who do you know that has ever replicated or duplicated the stuff that Jesus did? In the ninth chapter of Matthew, verse 18, a man came up to Jesus, a man came up to Jesus and said, My daughter's home, she just died. Come on to my house and raise my daughter or bring her back to life. And Jesus is going with the man to raise the girl from the dead. And as he was on the way, in verse number 20, the Bible says a woman came up behind him. Him is the pronoun modifying the noun Jesus. A woman came up behind him, H I M, and the woman touched. The H-E-M, hem of his garment. Immediately the, when the woman touched the hem, hem of Jesus' garment, I'm trying to differentiate between him and him. 
when the woman touched the H-E-M, she was instantly healed from an issue of blood. The woman had a monthly period that had been lasting for 12 years, and Jesus healed her on the spot. You have to understand, it wasn't the H-E-M, it was the H-I-M wearing the H-E-M. And then Jesus went on to the house and raised a young girl from the dead. Now, if Christian means Christ-like, how come you don't mean see that kind of stuff being pulled off? He raised the girl from the dead. Then in the seventh chapter of the book of Luke, remember the widow at name? She had a son. And the Bible says this particular son she had died, and they had left the funeral home, chapel. They were on their way to the cemetery to bury him. Jesus touched the casket, and when he touched the casket, the young man was brought back to life. Now, the Bible said he was carried out dead. Normally, the Greek word for dead is necros, like necrophilia, you love the dead. Necrophobia, you are afraid of the dead. That's the normal word for dead. But when the Bible said the young fellow was carried out dead, it's a, Greek, a different Greek word. I think the Greek word is thinko, and this word means dead and prepared. This word means the mortician picked up the boy and the mortician took the blood out of the body and he put formaldehyde and alcohol and arsenic and all that stuff that we commonly call embalming fluid in the body. So when Jesus raised him, that means he actually recreated him. That means he had to actually give him a new brain and give him a brain that had the same DNA and the same memory of all the things he had lived in his life till he became an adult. Had to give him new kidneys, new lungs. He recreated him and gave him back to his mama. Now if Christian means Christ-like, let me see any bishop. Let me see any evangelist go into a mortuary and raise up a dead embalmed body. If Christian means Christ-like, Jesus, in the 11th chapter of St. John, raised Lazarus from the dead. John 11, 43, he said, Lazarus, come forth. My son, Jock, and I, raise your hands, Jock. Jock and I were at a convention. And the guy was preaching and everybody was on his side. He was going to work. He said, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And the reason Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, because if he wouldn't have called me by name, it would have been a general resurrection. And Jock got so upset, he walked out to place pigeon-toed. Jock is normally pigeon-toed anyway, but when he get really mad, his toes go in even more. Jock walked out all pigeon-toed, and what upset Jock was, he knew that in that cemetery where Jesus raised Lazarus, it was a large cemetery. At least a hundred other fellows were named Lazarus in there. And he also knew that there were probably at least a million other people named Lazarus in the world. And if Jesus had to say Lazarus to stop him from being a general resurrection, when he said Lazarus come forth, how come everybody named Lazarus didn't get about the grave? Because Jesus knew what Lazarus he meant, that's why. And you reverse that now, we pray to Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Help me out, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And a fellow said to me, man, look, that ain't about nothing. He said, I'm from Mexico City. He said, Jesus' name in Mexico is Jesus. Down in Mexico City, it's a whole lot of guys named Jesus. And I know that's a fact because I, was, I used to preach for Elder Clayton Carr in El Paso, Texas. And this is before, way back in the day when it was halfway safe, I would walk across the border into Juarez, Mexico. And one time in Juarez, Mexico, I stood on the corner. I said, hey, Zeus, hey, Zeus. Five Mexican guys ran up to me, all of them named Jesus. It's a lot of people named Jesus, Jesus. In Athens, Greece, it's a lot of guys named Jesus. It's pronounced Yeshua. It's pronounced Jesus. And in Hebrew, it's pronounced Jesus. And in the Bible itself, Colossians 4.11, you got a man named Jesus who is justice. Luke 3.39, you got Jesus, the son of Eliezer. Hebrews 4 and 8, you got a man named Jesus who is Joshua. Acts 13, 5 and 6, you got a man named Jesus who is Bar Jesus. And then, of course, we have Jesus who's called the Christ. He said to me, calling Jesus don't mean nothing. It's a whole lot of Jesuses. But when we say Jesus, the only Jesus going to hear us is the Jesus who restored the girl back to life. The Jesus going to hear us is the Jesus we are referring to that raised Lazarus from the dead. So the word Christian does not mean Christ-like. On page 672, column 1,
paragraph three of the Greek English lexicon of New Testament words by Joseph Henry Thayer, he said the word Christian is from the Greek word Christianos, and it means follower and worshiper of Jesus Christ. A Christian is somebody who follows and worships Jesus, because in reality, we don't know nobody just like Jesus. Jesus Christ has never been duplicated and never been replicated. A follower and a worshiper of Jesus is a Christian. So the Bible says in Matthew 4 and 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You serve the God that you worship. I can hang out with anybody. That's why Evangelist Green, it was a treat to hang out with you. I can hang out with anybody 20 minutes. I will tell you who your God is because you serve the gods you worship. If you worship money, you serve your business or your job or whatever you do to get money. If you worship fashion, you serve clothes. If you worship education, you serve degrees. If you worship knowledge, you serve science. If you worship your body, you serve exercise. If you worship your belly, you serve food. If you worship lust, you serve sex. If you worship getting high, you serve alcohol. If you worship yourself, you serve pride. If you worship sin, you serve the devil. Let me admonish you, worship God and serve Jesus. Jesus is the only legitimate object of worship in the entire world. Anybody worshiping anything other than Jesus, your worship is illegal and it is illegitimate. Now, some of that stuff I mentioned, most of it is legitimate, but it ain't God, not to be worshiped. Some people worship money and they serve their job. You never see them pastors preaching on Sunday, done prayed and studied all week to give something God to God's people to bless them. They can't come to hear him preach. They're too busy. They got to keep the shop open. They're too busy working on Sunday. Look, money is legitimate, but it's not God. I'm staying next door at the past, at the parsonage. I just took my family over there, Bishop, and they looked at it. They say, "Wow!" Said, "Dad, this is better than any hotel in the world." And they walked. They said, "Look at all this and all that stuff you got me, Sister Green, to eat." And they said, "This is said you living big time. You a big baller and a shot caller." Now, I know you all didn't do that without money. See, you pay your tithes, give generous offerings. That happens because you had the money to purchase that property and then turn it into what it is now. I call it the profits quarters. See, it takes money to do that. Y'all could have never done a thing like that if this church would have been suffering from MDD. You know what MDD is. MDD is when your outgo is bigger than your income. When your outgo is bigger than your income, that means your upkeep is your downfall. When your upkeep is your downfall, it means your financial can-do cannot keep up with your capitalistic want-to. It means your stuff is fluff. It means your flow is slow. It means your money is funny. It means your change is strange. It means you are broke, busted, and disgusted because you got MDD money deficiency disorder. That's why you need to, I will say it again, pay your tithes and give generous offerings because you can't do this without money. But just don't worship money. Ecclesiastes 10.19 said, A feast is made for laughter, wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. You want to get high? Throw a party. Want to feel tipsy? Drink some wine. But if you're going shopping, take some money. We always say prayer is the answer. Prayer is the question. Money is the answer. Because the Bible said money answers all things. We need money, but it is not a God. Don't worship it. Some people worship education and serve degrees. Raise your hand, Dr. Charlie, Charles Graham. That's my son, Charles. He married to Charlie. I admire Dr. Graham so much. Dr. Graham is a PhD, a legitimate PhD. He didn't buy it on the computer office online somewhere. He went studying took all those classes, did all the challenges, wrote a dissertation so complicated and so complex, only a few people can even read it and understand it. But what I love about Dr. Graham, 
he yet has a capacity for biblical and spiritual reality he is as spiritual and biblical as he is sophisticated and educated that's the way it's supposed to be some people go to school and learn two or three words and they get all messed up and say apostolic ain't right baptism don't mean nothing ain't nothing about tongues don't worship education but get some of it just don't make a god out of it we having a service at our church the other greater grace in springfield and the lord was moving i'm not going to say the lord came in because my son jockey showed me that ain't correct the lord don't never come in he lives at a place where is his address but we were having a great service and like we say the lord came in and everybody was worshiping except one sister she was sitting up in the church looking like a texas mule in arkansas See, when you take a Texas mule out of Texas into Arkansas, Texas is wide open. You see all them trees, you get confused and know what to do. She was sitting up, she wouldn't worship. So I went to her after it. I said, when we have a visitation of God's worshiping presence like that, and you don't join in, what's wrong with you? She said, Brother Johnny, I couldn't join in with you in worship because that song, y'all were getting all happy off of the blood gun sign my name she said that is not proper grammar